Hi everyone, welcome to my channel and to part two of my two-part series on the history of spirit and ghost photography in America. Now last week we talked about the Fox sisters and the history of spiritualism in the United States. And when we left off, spiritualism was about to meet photography in the persona of one William Henry Mumler. I'm going to put a link at the top in case you haven't gotten a chance to see that video and would like to have a look. In part one, I spoke about the spirits, and today I'm going to both tell and show you actual photographs of those spirits. Let's get started. Our story continues in 1861, a time when photographers used their own glass plates that they coated with their own emulsions in order to take photos. These emulsions were not nearly as light sensitive as our current centers, and this led to fairly long exposure times. Into our story then walks a Bostonian named William Henry Mumler. Before becoming a spirit photographer, Mumler was an engraver and reportedly had no interest in spiritualism, though he did have an interest in photography. In March of 1861, he found himself at a friend's photography studio and decided to take his own self-portrait by prefocusing the camera on an empty chair and then sitting in the chair for the exposure. He then developed the photograph and was astonished to find an image that depicted not only him in the chair, but also a young girl sitting in the chair with him. A girl who he thought looked uncannily like his deceased cousin. Unfortunately, no matter where I've looked, I've been unable to find a copy of this photo, which is felt to likely be the world's first photograph of a ghost or spirit. His friend who owned the studio wanted to end this before it even began and offered Mumler this explanation. He had probably just coated the photographic emulsion on an old sheet of glass that had not been properly cleaned beforehand, and that he had essentially redeveloped the original image that had been on that glass. The image appeared hazy and ghost-like because it had been partly, but not fully, cleaned off of the glass plate. It made perfect sense, and Mumler accepted this explanation. At least he did at first. Shortly thereafter, Mumler was visited by a friend of his who was a spiritualist, and as a joke, or at least legend has it that it was a joke, Mumler showed him the photograph with the spirit, but conveniently neglected to leave out the explanation about the glass plate being dirty. Well, <laughs> apparently his friend didn't take it as a joke, because about a week later, a newspaper in New York called The Herald in Progress published a story about a Bostonian photographer who took a picture of a ghost. Shortly thereafter, a known spiritualist journal in Boston called The Banner of Light republished that New York article, and in addition, they gave the address of the studio where Mumler had taken the photo. Now, at this point, Mumler said that he had better go confess to his friend, the photographer whose studio he used, about what had happened before this whole thing blew up into a whole mess. The problem is, by the time he got to the studio to make this confession to his friend, the studio was filled with people who wanted Mumler to take their picture. Well, they didn't know Mumler was Mumler when he walked in, but the receptionist, who, interestingly, he later married, introduced Mumler to the crowd as the man who had taken the photographs. At this point, Mumler seemingly didn't want anything to do with this and explained to the crowd what had happened in terms of the glass plate causing the problem, and that was the cause of the spirit appearing on the photo. <laughs> Nonetheless, Everyone in the crowd still wanted a portrait taken by Mumler. Mumler finally agreed to take two portraits. Well, <laughs> you can see where this is going. One of the two portraits had a spirit in it along with the subject of the photo. And with that, spirit photography was born. Now everyone wanted to sit for a portrait by Mumler, and he essentially became a full-time spirit photographer and he made portraits of some very prominent Bostonians. He never promised that a spirit would appear in a photo, and many times none appeared. But many times they did. In 
when there appeared to be something unusual in a photo, Mumler helped coach his subjects to identify who they thought it might be. Now, one of the great photographers of that era was a fellow named J.W. Black. Black was very suspect of this whole thing and was sure that if Mumler was performing some sort of trickery, he would certainly be able to spot it right away. So Mr. Black contacted Mumler and agreed to pay him the sum of $50 to take his portrait, which was quite a lot of money, but only if he could watch the entire process, start to finish, cleaning and clothing the glass plates included, in order to, pardon the pun, expose exactly what was going on. Mumler agreed. Even though Black thoroughly inspected and observed the entire process, well, you can see where this is going, Mumler's portrait of Black yielded not only a picture of Mr. Black, but there was a ghost in the photo as well. Black, despite all his experience, hadn't found any irregularities in the way that Mumler had made the photograph. Soon, people began coming from all over in order to try to expose Mumler as a fraud. They even brought their own glass plates, and yet their portraits, not always, but frequently, yielded an image of a spirit along with themselves. The court of public opinion eventually turned against Mumler. In fact, even the spiritualists ended up turning against Mumler when it turned out that some of the ghosts that ended up in his photographs were actually people who were very much alive. Things could get a little awkward for him. For example, there was the case of the woman whose brother had died in the Civil War and who wanted to see if her brother might revisit her as a spirit in one of Mumler's photographs. She sat for a portrait, and sure enough, her brother did revisit in the portrait. The problem is that the brother revisited again a few weeks later, returning from the Civil War very much alive. Then there was the case of the ghost in a photograph who turned out to be the subject's wife. And the wife was very much alive, and in fact, Mumler had just photographed her a few weeks earlier. Things smelled a little fishy. In 1868, Mumler ended up moving to New York City. Now, the mayor of New York didn't really like this, and he thought that the whole thing was fraudulent and decided that he was going to send the reporter undercover to expose Mumler. So the reporter ended up going to Mumler's studio and sitting for a portrait, and sure enough, a ghost appeared in the photograph. However, it turned out that the ghost was the reporter's father-in-law, who was very much alive. The mayor had Mumler arrested for fraud. At Mumler's trial, witnesses were called, and they described many ways that Mumler might have made his spirit photographs using trickery. The problem is, he had never been caught in the act. Never, despite so many people trying to catch him. Ultimately, the trial argument went something like this. There are lots of things that we can do today that we haven't been able to do in the past. And Mr. Mumler has probably just invented a process that we haven't been able to figure out yet, and that's how he's doing this. Well, needless to say, that argument didn't hold much water with the jury, and Mumler was acquitted. <laughs> By the way, though, Mumler did eventually figure out and invent a process that nobody had figured out before, having nothing to do with spirit photography. It's called the Mumler process, and he invented the first way to transfer photographs to newsprint. So let's have a look at some of Mumler's spirit photography, including his most famous photograph, which I'm going to save for last. As far as I can tell, Mumler never did say how he made spirits appear in his photographs, or admit that they were anything other than real ghosts. Unlike the Fox sisters, he never confessed. In 1870, 
Mumler took the most famous spirit photograph of his career. Five years after President Abraham Lincoln had been assassinated, his widow, Mary Todd Lincoln, came to have her portrait taken, hoping that her husband would visit her as a spirit. Now, some say that she actually presented herself to Mumler as a Mrs. Tundle, hoping that he wouldn't know who she was. Whether that's the case or whether he would have known who she was anyway is something that's probably lost to history. At any rate, that session yielded this photograph. The photo he took certainly speaks for itself. It was also the last known photograph ever taken of Mrs. Lincoln. Ultimately, William Howard Mumler died in poverty in 1884. The New York trial had completely ruined his career, despite the acquittal. His obituary, in fact, barely even mentioned his spirit photography, and instead focused on the general contributions he made to photography. Contributions like the Mumler process, which I described earlier. Well, I hope you enjoyed this two-part series on the history of spirit photography in America. Again, I'm leaving some links to further reading down in the video description in case anyone is interested to look further into this topic. I'd also love to read and respond to any comments you might have about this series. I'm Howard, and my channel is about introducing viewers to photographers who inspire, to discussing all sorts of photographic topics, and to enhancing creativity with Lightroom and Photoshop tutorials. And if those topics sound interesting to you, I'd certainly appreciate your support by having you click that subscribe button below. We'll see you next time.